Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Hello, everyone. Today, Joseph and I uh, are missing Lisa, who is away, and uh, we're going to do what we often do, which is to unpack some archetypal material, otherwise known as a fairy tale. And the tale we're going to look at today is The Six Swans, which has a number of variations that's told uh, in lots of different ways, from Twelve Brothers, The Children of Lear, uh, Ravens, The Little Mermaid by Hans Christian Andersen. Um, he also wrote The Wild Swans. So there are some themes in this fairy tale that uh, have been alive uh, for centuries, and we're going to see how they apply to us. And Joseph is going to read us the story, so sit back and let yourself be read too. A king went hunting in a vast forest, got lost, and couldn't find his way out. Finally, he came upon a witch and asked her to show him the way out of the forest. However, the witch told him she wouldn't do it. He had to remain there, and he would lose his life. He could be saved if he married her daughter. The king cherished his life, and he was so frightened, he said yes. So the queen brought the maiden to him. Though she was young and beautiful, he couldn't look at her without getting the creeps and secretly shuddering. However, he intended to keep his promise. Then the old woman led both of them on the right path out of the forest, and once they were at the king's home, the witch's daughter became his wife. Now the king still had seven children from his first wife, six boys and a girl, and since he was afraid the stepmother might harm them, he brought them to a castle in the middle of a forest. It lay so well concealed, nobody knew the way to it, and he himself would not have found it if a wise woman had not given him a ball of yarn. When he threw the ball before him, the yarn unwound itself and showed him the way. Since the king loved his children very much, he frequently went to the castle. However, the queen became curious and wanted to know why he was going into the forest all alone. She interrogated the servants and they revealed the entire secret. The first thing she did was to use her cunning and acquire the ball of yarn. Then she took seven small shirts and went out into the forest. The ball of yarn showed her the way, and when the six little princes saw her coming from the distance, they were delighted, because they thought their father was coming and ran out to her. But all at once she threw a shirt over one of them, and as soon as they were touched by the shirts, they were turned into swans and flew away over the forest. Now the queen thought that she had gotten rid of all her stepchildren and returned home. So the maiden who remained in her room was saved. The next day the king went to the castle in the forest, and she told him what had happened and showed him the swan feathers that had fallen down from her six brothers into the courtyard. The king was horrified, but couldn't believe that the queen had done such an evil deed. At the same time, he was worried that the princess might also be stolen away from him, so he wanted to take her with him. However, she was afraid of her stepmother and begged the king to allow her to spend one more night in the castle. 
Then during the night, she fled and went deeper into the forest. She walked the entire day, and towards the evening she came to a hut. Once she entered, she found a room with six small beds. Since she was now tired, she lay herself down beneath one of the beds and wanted to spend the night there. Yet at sunset, six swans came flying through the window, landed on the floor, and blew one on each other until all their feathers were blown off, as if some cloth had slipped off them. And there stood her six brothers. She crawled out from beneath the bed, and the brothers were both glad and distressed to see her. You can't stay here, they said. This is a robber's den, and when they come home from their marauding, they live here. We can take off our swan skins for only a quarter of an hour each evening and assume our human form during that time. Then it's all over. If you want to rescue us, you must sew six little shirts made out of asters. But during this time, you're not allowed to speak or laugh, otherwise all your work will be for naught. As the brothers were speaking, the quarter of an hour expired, and once again they were transformed into swans. The next morning, however, the maiden gathered asters, perched herself on a branch of a tall tree, and began to sew. She didn't speak a single word or laugh. She just sat there and concentrated on her work. After she had been there for some time, the king who owned this land went hunting and came to the tree where the maiden was perched. His hunters called to her and told her to come down, but because she was not permitted to answer them, she wanted to satisfy them by throwing them presents. So she threw them her golden necklace. Yet they continued to call out. So she threw them her girdle. And when this didn't work either, she threw down her garters. And little by little, everything she had on. And could do without until she had nothing left but her little shift. Still, all this was not enough for the hunters. They climbed the tree, carried her down, and led her by force to the king, who was astonished by her beauty. He covered her with his cloak, lifted her onto his horse, and brought her to his home. Even though she was mute, he loved her with all his heart, and she became his wife. Now the king's mother was angry about all of this, and spoke ill of the young queen. Nobody knew where the wench came from, and she wasn't worthy of the king. When the queen gave birth to her first child, the old mother-in-law took the child away and smeared the queen's mouth with blood while she slept. Then she accused the young queen of having eaten her own child and of being a sorceress. However, because of his great love for his wife, the king refused to believe this. Sometime later, the queen gave birth to a second prince, and the godless mother-in-law played the same trick and accused the queen of cannibalism again. Since the queen wasn't allowed to talk and had to sit there mute and work on the six little shirts, she couldn't save herself and was sentenced to burn the stake. The day came when the sentence was to be carried out. It was exactly the last day of the six years and she had managed to finish sewing the six shirts. Only the left sleeve of the last shirt was missing. When she was led to the stake, she took the six shirts with her, and when she stood on the pile of wood and the fire was about to be lit, she saw the six swans flying through the air until they descended right near her. So she threw the shirts over them, and as soon as the shirts touched them, the swanskins fell off, and her six brothers stood before her in the flesh. Only the sixth one was missing his left arm. Instead, he had a swan's wing on his shoulder. Now she could speak again, 
and told everyone how her mother-in-law had slandered her in such a wicked way. Consequently, the old woman was tied to the stake, burned to death. However, the young queen lived with the king and her six brothers a long time in great joy. I'm, Where would you like uh, to start? Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking back to uh, what an important story this was uh, for me as a child. And that the part of the story that I loved the most, and it still gets me, is that at the very end, uh, all the sweaters are complete um, in this wonderful um, episode that foreshadows just in time delivery. Uh, the swans come flying in, but there's one talisman wing uh, that remains the swan's wing that, that testifies to what she has done, mm. that that one brother will always have that one wing, a and the, the fact that, that it's not perfect mm. um, is visual, concrete evidence of here is what I was able to do, uh, which uh, really got me as a child rather than, oh, uh, they all turn back into brothers and everybody just goes off to live happily ever after. It's like, no, you have to remember what your sister did, mm -hmm. uh, what her sacrifice uh, yielded is everyone's redemption with the one talisman wing. Uh, so that that takes me into you know kind of the theme of this this story, and there are so many stories about about swans and this redemption theme of when will they become human again, or what does it take. Uh, to change um, the little mermaid's tail into feet, what does it take uh, for, for the for the feminine uh, to be redeemed? Mm. Uh, and that in many a tale, uh, the hero goes riding out to do all kinds of active deeds in the world, find the treasure or the water of life, or bring home a bride, or um, release the magic uh, item from its fortress. Um, and that it's a very different image that we have from the heroic feminine, which is, you know, as in this tale, it is tied to eros, it is tied to love, it is tied to sacrifice. We have these uh, wonderful themes, but maybe we can um, take the the story section by section and just uh, work through it a bit. And uh, like my a dream, is, like a dream, exactly. <laughs> my go-to is often to think of it like a dream. Okay. So we start with the king, and he went hunting in this vast forest, and he got lost and couldn't find his way out, which is also the beginning of Dante's Divine Comedy. Mm -hmm. You know, walking through That's a dark woods, and wood. I took this path instead of that one, and that made all the difference. Yeah, I could not find my way. So what's a forest? Well, it's the wilderness or the wilderness. Um, it's often a symbol for the unconscious. And that's where we often meet witches, isn't it? Witches and enchanted princes, talking animals. Um, all of these are the things you find in the forest. You know whenever somebody goes hunting in the forest and gets lost, the tale is about to begin. The king is often 
interpreted as the ruling principle in the psyche. Mm -hmm. Many of us, when we do deep, deep work, may find that there is a central value or a value system that really guides the first half of our lives. And often that doesn't work so well as we continue to mature because the first king is often created in infancy or early childhood, and we need something much more sophisticated as we continue to grow. So the king is going hunting, which often is for sport, in a vast forest, and he gets lost. Interesting that he's also hunting alone, which of course would probably never happen. So another way to think of that in terms of this idea of midlife is that we will begin to venture beyond our normal scope of curiosity, and we may find ourselves in a depression, a midlife depression, and we can't find our way out. We're listless. We're lost. We don't know where to go, what to do, what the next direction is. And then he finds a kind of anthropomorphic version of the forest itself. Which in the forest are one? And one of the ways that I could imagine that is the witch is as ruthless as nature is. Because if he remains lost in the forest and remains there, he probably would die, would lose his life. And the witch is speaking to him very much like nature, red in tooth and claw. So we tend to be frightened by these anthropomorphic mm-hmm. images of nature, but over and again, they may seem monstrous to our sentimental human mm-hmm. attitude, but they often are just as black and white and stark as nature, in fact, can be. Yeah. And that here is this image of the feminine uh, archetypally as a witch in the negative aspect of uh, that the feminine can be beneficent, at, just like Mother Nature. It's a beautiful summer day, the flowers are blooming, the sun is warm, and Mother Nature can also be, as you said, red in tooth and claw of storms and uh, floods and all kinds of other things. So uh, as an archetype, feminine and masculine, our opposites, we could say yin and yang, or in alchemy, it's the king and queen, mm-hmm. uh, sun and moon. Mm-hmm. And uh, as, as archetypal, as archetypes, they have a positive and negative aspect. And here, when the king is lost, psychologically lost, confused, doesn't know where he is or what to do, what does he meet? He meets a witch who says, you have to marry my daughter. So as the price for his survival, he he has to join with the negative feminine uh, who gives him the creeps Mm -hmm. and makes him secretly shudder. So we, we have this meeting of opposites right at the outset. Well, I think that if the witch is the personification of nature, and if we think of the the king, perhaps a widower, has fallen into depression, Hmm. he's lost, you know, and, and the voice of nature says, listen, if you don't choose life, you're going to die. And, and Hmm. nature itself says, "I, I will provide this young, this young feminine, I, I will provide a new wife and who is beautiful. And you must participate in life. Yeah. Y- you can't stay lost in the dark woods as the mourning king. But the ego is not, is not on with this. He's not 
immediately mm -hmm. thrilled about all of this, but he does suddenly think that he wants to live. And when we're lost in tremendous grief, yeah. a tremendous melancholy, we may reach the nadir. Um, and Jung said, often in a deep, dark place, we will begin to have suicidal ideas. And for Jung, he often thought, that's the place where things begin to change. That when we're up against the choice, will I choose life? And the spirit of the forest says, either you're going to choose life or you're going to die. And if you choose life, I'll give you a hand. I mean, I've, I have a beautiful daughter. Mm -hmm. um, it's not sentimental. It's not about love. No mm -hmm. one's talking about love here. Nature herself gives an option, and when he finally really faces the fact that he'd prefer to live, he says, okay. I mean, and she's young and beautiful, but you can see that the king's attitude is still ambivalent. Couldn't look at her without feeling creeped out and, and shuddering and, and feeling very ambivalent mm -hmm. about choosing life. but. He does have a certain kind of faithfulness in terms of keeping his promises. And so nature writes his instincts. And nature suddenly wakes him up. He has a sense of where he is, and nature leads him out of the depression, out of the forest, mm -hmm. with this new, this new lease on life. But as you said, Deb, there's a lot of ambivalence, and this isn't a meek feminine. She's, she also has magic powers that can be mm -hmm. um, dangerous and potent. Right. So this is a meeting of opposites mm -hmm. uh, that is laid out right at the beginning of the tale. And then what happens next? Well, um, our, our good king, uh, he gets it that his wife is uh, uh, dangerous. Mm -hmm. and would uh, intend to uh, hurt his children. So back to the forest. So here's the forest in a different iteration this time. Um, there's a castle in the middle of the forest, very well concealed. A wise woman, and we see this uh, theme in other tales, especially the, the tale of Theseus and Ariadne, a wise woman gives him a ball of yarn that magically um, unwinds itself so that he can uh, find his way into this well-concealed castle in the forest. So, you know, here's, here's a strategy. And uh, don't we all do this of like, okay, um, then let me sequester what is most precious to me in a place where only I have access. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a good... Uh, ego-oriented effort at, at protection. Uh, this is the place in the unconscious, in the forest, that is a castle. So there is something has been uh, built and created um, out of consciousness in the middle of the forest. Mm -hmm. And there's a way to get there. So this seems like a good idea. Well, Except, of course, we know it's not going to work. <laughs> And I find myself um, uh, having fun uh, not demonizing the witch and the witch's daughter. Because uh, there, if this were a dream, there's a purposiveness to yeah. all of this happening. Yes, right. And so the, we don't know that the daughter, the witch's daughter, or now the king's wife, really would hate his children. She hates that he's split. She hates that he's mm. disappearing from the marriage. Where, where are you going? Like, what is this, what is this other ob obsession that you have taking you away from your new wife, from your new relationship? And that the king had carried a kind of paranoia. The king was afraid that this new mother would harm his children, so he secrets this life his creativity, 
his yeah. previous dynamic fertile self hides yeah. it away in the yeah. unconscious but we don't right. we don't know that she would be so terrible for the kids but well, he's decided she, she's pretty terrible she turns them all into swans well she doesn't kill them but she does <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> i mean you know there's a lot okay. of choices one could make um no I uh, I would say, um, I would posit that she is, um, you know, she does mean them harm. And uh, the king who is trying to protect uh, the life of children, uh, six sons and a daughter, uh, comes up with an ego-oriented strategy, a compromise with the unconscious. There'll be a castle in the middle of the forest, something that consciousness and uh, planning uh, has created. It doesn't work. And um, it's also a theme in fairy tales and in uh, the Odyssey of, of, this, of the unfaithful servants. It's a very mythical theme of, of what are the servants really serving? And although it seems like in the tale, it's sort of like, that's terrible. You know, these servants ratted out uh, these uh, to the evil witch wife, uh, the, 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 the children, and that's terrible, and she's going to harm them. But they are in service to the greater tale of, of how is this antagonism, how is this enmity, how are these opposites uh, going to be reconciled, or are they going to be reconciled? But the story must move forward, mm -hmm. uh, and um, off goes the wicked queen into the ball of forest. And there's a glitch in the in the Grimm's tale, which I like. She says it says she took seven small shirts and went to the forest. So. She knows there are seven uh, children, and she throws a shirt over each of the six boys who are turned into swans. And then it says she thought she got rid of all her stepchildren and returned home. But there's a part of her that she still has one shirt left over. So somewhere she, she now, um, something in the psyche forgets that one has escaped. And so even the most wicked, which we see in the Bluebird tales, of, of that something in the psyche wants redemption. Something in the worst part of the psyche, a wicked stepmother or a, a wicked uh, mother-in-law, uh, so, some sort of uh, the wicked Bluebeard, something there also wants redemption. And so she she knows somewhere uh, that there's another child. Now, I want to say again, I, it's interesting. Deb and I have are running two parallel movies in our minds. Uh, for me, I'm curious about how the king was changed when he went into the unconscious, and he brought back something inside himself, something instinctive, maybe dangerous, and he doesn't want to expose his children to this instinctive yep. thing that he has retrieved in his mm -hmm. depressive sojourns. So he sequesters whatever they represent, perhaps quite literally his children, but also some other vestige of his previous life. He doesn't want to undergo the regression that is required for him to come forward in a new way. And so he hides these things away, but what he has brought back in his soul from the forest won't be cut off, won't allow him to escape whatever it is that he has to go through. Yeah. And she ferrets out that something has happened and it's and it's unacceptable for him to say split 
in this way. Um, what do you make of the fact that it's a ball of yarn? Uh, I find that it's a really interesting. Um, it's kind of tossed and it rolls through the forest and provides the way. Yarn is something often that was made by women. Yeah. That spinning wool into yarn and dyeing it was a, a woman's mystery, a woman's craft. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's the taking of the raw fur mm -hmm. and making it into, again, a primary substance. The yarn hasn't been yet made into clothing, but it's a resource. Um, so I'm wondering if it has something to do clearly with the feminine, but I, w I wonder what else we make of it being yarn. Uh, well, I'm going back to the story of the of the Minotaur and how uh, Theseus uh, was going to slay the Minotaur and Ariadne, a princess uh, on Crete, gives him a ball of red thread uh, that he can uh, unwind as he goes down through the dark labyrinth and find his way back. So I think it's just the connecting principle. Um, and uh, it's given by the positive feminine. It's given to the king by a wise woman, uh, and it will magically un un unroll and lead him to the to the castle in the forest, where where the children are. But uh, I think it is really the connecting principle that, that uh, is also just archetypal and. And thread and uh, sewing and yarn and spinning are are also um, emanations of of the feminine, of uh, the weaving and the creating that that come from that. But in this story, I think, as in the story of the Minotaur, it's the connecting principle between conscious and unconscious. The ball of yarn un unrolls to go into the unconscious safely and then presumably you follow it back out again of how do we how do conscious and unconscious interact with one another uh so um the stepmother finds her way into the forest she turns the boys into swans uh the king is horrified and uh, he can't believe that the queen had done such an evil deed. Sort of like, wait a minute, you, you kind of knew she was a no-good Nick right from the get-go, So, and that's why you hid your children in the first place. So um, a little part of me wants to say, you know, snap out of it, um, get, get real. Uh, and he wants to take the remaining child, the, the one girl, uh, he wants to take her with him. But our girl is smarter than that. She knows she has to run away. She, she knows uh, she has to leave. She knows she can't go with her father. And uh, she walked the entire day and came to a little hut. And then all her brothers come flying in there. This is an odd part of the story, I think, that um, the, she comes to a hut where, coincidentally, there are six cots for her six brothers, um, and they are glad and distressed to see her again. And they tell her, this is a robber's den. Um, when they come home from their marauding, they live here. And yet that's also where the brothers live with their six cots and they have 15 minutes a day where they can take their feathers off and be human. So I, I think this is a, a, an interesting place in the story. What do you make of it? Well, it's about shadow. It's that, mm. um, again, as we, as we were thinking about the yarn, I think the, the wise woman is the mother complex. And the yarn is an umbilical cord. You toss the umbilicus. 
it into is. the forest and it, it, it finds your, your children and it also finds a place where you can sequester them in this kind of uterine environment. It's a place of regression. Yeah. And so yeah. the king, again, being so um, unwilling to embrace this next stage of his life, to take a wife, that it's all about retreating into this maternal regression where his children are going to stay children and sequestered away. Again, the spirit of the forest, the spirit of nature says, no, no way. I think it's interesting that when the, the spirit of the forest finds these regressed parts of the king's psyche, she doesn't kill them. She puts them in touch with this instinctive level of being. She turns them into swans who are going to now be part of the natural world, which is, from a restorative standpoint, often in a regression, we have to reconnect with an instinctive level. That however we've been going about things isn't, is not acceptable. The king also doesn't feel like he has enough potency to stand in front of the new wife and say, keep your hands off my kids. That his response, <laughs> she's so dangerous, I've got to spirit you away someplace yeah. because I couldn't possibly have enough personal power to set some rules in the house. He's already, he's, he's, the old king is so weak and still so trapped in this um, depressive forest. So, this nature I, I want to give the king, I want to cut the king a little slack here. Uh, he, he does choose life uh, as the price of getting out of the forest when he first goes in. Mm -hmm. He does feel that he must keep the promise. I mean, after all, he's marrying a witch, so there's going to be hell to pay if he reneges on that. And he does come up with a strategy to protect his children. Well, but if we uh, stick to a symbolic attitude, they're not really children. They're parts of him. Uh, they're parts of him uh, represented as children, and he is doing his best to protect those uh, parts uh, that are, are imaged as his offspring. Yes, to separate so, them out, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not willing to, um, you know, really um, denigrate his efforts all that much. It's what, it's what we do, I think, a lot in life. We we come up with an idea that we think is going to work, uh, but it is not what psyche really demands of us. And so the first effort where we plan something out and we decide we're going to do it and it really makes sense often doesn't work. Uh, and it might be a striving for a goal, for example, that uh, Family values decree that you will um, become an engineer, let's say, mm -hmm. you know, and it doesn't quite fit. So you sequester those other parts of yourself somewhere else. You explain it to yourself. It doesn't really matter. Um, maybe on Saturday night you can uh, join the jam session, uh, you know, somewhere, some other end of campus or in town. Uh, so, but it's a good idea, mm -hmm. but it's conceived by consciousness and it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And eventually you're, you know, perhaps it's your musical nature or your love of poetry or, you know, I want to hike the Himalayas, uh, will win out. But, I, but I think it's just very human to at first say, Here, here's what I'm going to do. Ego will take care of this. I'm going to make mm -hmm. a plan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And again, whatever change that the new wife is going to bring into his psyche, he's frightened of that. And he wants to keep these things from being affected. So this nature goddess, 
this kind of Circe, really. It's a, it's like Circe, her ability to yeah. transform um, these human dynamics into these instinctive places, comes in, tosses these shirts onto the little boys, mm -hmm. turning them into these instinctive creatures that fly into the air. The maiden, who is a vestige of his first wife, is, is an image of the amalgam of him and his wife, is kept safe. But the king isn't sure um, how to stay in relationship with her. He's worried again that the princess might also mm -hmm. be stolen away from him. So the king's anxiety is at the root of so many things. He can't imagine being able to protect her in the face of this instinctive energy that he's brought back from the forest, from the encounter in the beginning of the, of the dream, so to speak, the fairy tale. Uh, he's, the king is going to do something, um, again, that isn't going to work. Uh, we don't mm -hmm. quite know what it is. He's already worried that he'll, he won't be able to protect the princess. And he wanted to take her with him. That's a bad idea. Um, this is another kind of idea, like the castle in the middle of the forest. That's not going to work. But this part of the psyche that is mm -hmm. this little girl mm -hmm. knows better. She, she knows it's not going to work. Uh, so she begs the king to say, oh, just let me spend one more night here. And then she takes off and finds the hut in the middle of the forest and has the meeting with her, her brothers uh, in the robber's den. Mm -hmm. So I think that's interesting that the brothers with six little cots that must belong to them um, are, are hanging out in a robber's den. And when they come home from their marauding, mm -hmm. they live here. So, so the robbers and the swans live together. Because the, the robbers are the swans. That the, the boys are sometimes robbers, they're sometimes boys, and they're sometimes swans. And they're doing <laughs> just what the father did, which is to split. He brought home this fierce, this fierce energy from yeah. the forest that's dangerous. And the boys do the same thing to this little girl. There's another thing that comes back from the forest, and, and you, you can't be here. You, could, you couldn't possibly tolerate this mm -hmm. dangerous thing, and so you, know, you, must, you must hide. I also want to say that the princess has been changed in some way. You know, she hides, or at least she doesn't come out to meet the father. Um, she stays back for whatever reason. When the king says he's going to take her back, she, she flies off in the middle of the night. That some part of the swan energy has affected her, and she also has enough of an instinctive capacity to take to the air mm. and follow her instinct, which leads her back to her fellow swans. So something yes, good and, and useful is woken up there. And another place where she's sequestered. This is no longer uh, a castle. It's a hut mm -hmm. uh, where, where robber energy, swan energy, and human form brother energy is, is all present. And she is given the task. If you want to rescue us, you must sew six little shirts made out of asters. Mm -hmm. But you may not speak or laugh. So if you, we are now, we're trapped in this world of instinct and shadow. We're either swans or we're robbers. And if we think of what is a robber, well, that's, that is a human being who is functioning like a creature of the forest. Animals steal things. If, I mean, if they can 
find yeah. food. They're not going to pay for it. They're, they're, they're out and taking what they need in order to survive. So the, the hunter, the instinct, the swan, these, are, these boys are captured by this instinctive world. And there is a possibility with the, the mother-sister yeah. to have the ego restored so that their human ego can actually contain Mm-hmm. These overwhelming instinctive affects, if yeah. she can give them a new garb. So then it comes into also what are these um, shirts? What do, what do shirts mean? A shirt made out of, I guess, mm-hmm. swan feathers, a shirt made out of asters. And that depending and on the shirt different. that you wear, yeah. It's different in different stories. Um, yeah. Sometimes she has to sew it out of stinging nettles, well, which was the version I remember as a child. Like, wow, you know, that would really just do a killer job on your fingers um, doing this day in and day out. But well, let's think about for a minute, what's a swan? Mm-hmm. Uh, now, there are variations on this tale. Sometimes there's one that, has to do with ravens. Um, there are various kind of shape shifting things, but um, swans are big in mythology. Really? I mean, they're huge white birds. They're just perfect for um, symbolizing. And, uh, you know, the whiteness is a symbol of purity, uh, sincerity, innocence. Um, also, swans are solar. Uh, they're not uh, deities of the moon, they're, they're deities of the sun. And uh, Zeus turned himself into a swan in order to mate with uh, Leda and give birth to two sons. Um, so th- there's something about benevolence, purity, swans mate for life. So they're symbols of, of fidelity. Um, in the Hindu tradition, Brahma rides a swan, um, the divine bird, uh, which laid on the waters the cosmic egg, the golden egg from which Brahma swan sprang. And the supreme swan, swan the Paramahansa, um, is the universal ground of self. The swans are a very, very big image of all these wonderful potentials. Uh, and their 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 brothers are in this hut, and when two things exist side by side, we we might uh, posit there's a, a a relationship between them. And the negative side here is the marauding robbers. And then we have the the Swan brothers, uh, with a little interlude of human form. So something needs to be redeemed. And our girl is hard at it. Um, she does what anyone would do, gather the asters, and then you perch yourself on the branch of a tall tree. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, she's That's returned. not what I would pick. <laughs> well, but what we see is this bird behavior has actually influenced her. <laughs> That's right. That, That's... that she is subtly yeah. swan-ish. Um, yeah, flying yeah, that's into great. the forest, following your instincts, taking to the tree. Um, I'm assuming that an aster in that medieval world meant the same thing that we think of as an aster, but I don't know that to be true. I'm assuming it's a flower of some kind, mm-hmm. but yeah, yeah. And when I think of asters that I see in my garden, you know, a, a petal of an aster could be seen as a different kind of feather. They're both Mm. shaped in a similar way. The flower, which I think is interesting, if we're right in that, is also the sexual part of of what a flower plant is. So flowers, they put out their leaves and stems. The flower is the genitalia of the Mm. 
mm. of the plant, which mm. then is pollinated and produces seeds, etc. So one of the one of the things that occurs to me about this particular fairy tale is that the boys are trapped in a prepubescent place. Swans as symbols of spiritual purity by casting the shirts onto them that they remain ever white, ever regressed, ever childlike, caught in mm. a kind of puer flying around and playing robbers. But the flower is a very subtle symbol of sexual maturity. So if you mm. give us a, a garb that is both beautiful and has something to do with fertility, that then we can return to being human and also continue to mature, continue to become sexual. And, and the great problem in the beginning of the fairy tale is that he, when he looks at his mate, he's not full of ardor and lust. He's creeped out by this beautiful maiden. He's not having an instinctive sexual response. And so the boys are also caught in this ever pure place of being magical swans because mm -hmm. the king is also not in a mature place. And so she is set to work, just as you said, she takes to the tree like a bird, and even the word perched, mm -hmm. they could have said sat in the tree, but she's perched, which birds perch in trees. She doesn't speak or laugh like a bird. Birds don't speak or laugh. So she has to assume some aspect of the brothers. She has to co-participate mm -hmm. in a symbolic way in this place. Here comes our second king. Mm-hmm. Who is full of art. Well, just like a dream. You know, this is, is very much like a dream mm -hmm. uh, where something happens again. Uh, you know, people dream all the time that, you know, I was walking along here and I, I met uh, a friend. Then I was in a store or at a restaurant or in my childhood home. And uh, and a different someone is there. So we tr track the, the theme here of uh, who are these someones that appear in your dream several times? What's the theme? Is there a commonality? Well, here's the commonality. There's another king. So um, the king co is going hunting, and um, the, his, his uh, henchmen tell her to come on down from the tree. And she's trying to um, uh, appease them by throwing down little treasures, uh, her necklace, her belt, her garters, um, until she's basically reduced to just a little shift. So, so all of her persona attributes uh, she has tossed down thinking that the men will be satisfied with them. But, of course, it does. It, I mean, if somebody was throwing down a golden necklace and some garters from a tree, would you stick around or would you leave? So, um, of course, uh, they stick around and bring her to the king. And now she is pretty well stripped of all of her persona vestiges. Uh, she is just a maiden uh, in a little shift. And, of course, our king falls in love with her and brings her home to marry. So one of the things that I uh, see is uh -oh. <laughs> she's also, well, she is casting off her infantile persona. That she's in the tree, mm. she's being dutiful, she wants to redeem the masculine. Mm. And she says she's going to satisfy them by throwing them a little presents. It's so innocent, it's so young. And Here's this, here's a little bow, here's a necklace, here's a ring, that, that all of the things that a child might have. And when, just as you said, 
the persona of the child is is surrendered. The king looks at her and says, my God, you are astonishingly beautiful. Mm-hmm. He doesn't look at her and say, oh my God, you're a lost infant. And then he restores yeah. her modesty, but with his cloak, which is the cloak of the king, yes. which has status. Yeah. It's an adult right. garb. It's uh, she is now under the clothing. aegis. Mm-hmm. She's under the aegis of the king. And I imagine that when she is in her little shift, that it's a white shift, and that here's another reference to sort of a swan, a state mm-hmm. of purity, uh, yeah. without any accoutrement, and uh, it is just her. Right. Uh, and the king falls in love with her when she is stripped of these other ways that we use to identify ourselves. And now we have the king's mother, who is angry about all of this and spoke ill of the young queen. Nobody knew where the wench came from. She wasn't worthy of the king, so now she's a wench. So here's the second iteration of the evil witch who was originally in the forest and um, told the first king, you have to marry my daughter. So now we have um, the evil uh, mother-in-law who is out to get our young queen. So our queen um, is, meanwhile, maintaining her silence and her uh, serious demeanor because she can't laugh either. Uh, And, of course, she gets pregnant. And the mother-in-law concocts this horrible thing and uh, steals the baby, smears the young woman, uh, her, her face with blood, to try to make everybody believe that um, she cannibalized her own child. So this is a strange medieval um, (laughs) artifact. (gasps) Oh, God, yes. It was something called the blood libel, and it was a terrible, terrible thing. And it was particularly delivered to to Jews that were in uh, living in Europe. So when neighbors became envious of a prosperous Jewish family, and they were particularly psychopathic, and they, they would come up with this story that the Jews were using the blood of new infants for their Shabbat meals. And they would mm. level this accusation, and the Jewish families would be, at the very least, all their mm-hmm. property would be taken and they would be driven out of town and sometimes killed. Sometimes there may have been uh, a premature death or a miscarriage somewhere in the village and even an infant corpse would be somehow mm-hmm. pushed into the basement of the house or, or hidden somewhere in the area to prove that they had done this terrible blood libel. So this, this terrible thing that's happening um, here it is something that would have been recognized in this fair tale, many of which are can, can be traced back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. So she's being accused, she's being slandered, the blood libel is now being delivered, and she is also being accused of being another creature of the forest. She's being accused of being some kind of a beast, an animal, eats young things that that isn't human, and is therefore dangerous, can't can't marry something that is so savage, that is so inhuman, much like what the king brings back from the forest in the beginning of the tale, Hmm. can't possibly be permitted. There's also a problem here in the psyche again, that there is a mother complex in the young king that will not allow him to move Mm. on. And so 
the first king comes into the forest, and I would say, is bereft, will not move on, then here we have an outpicturing of the mother complex that will not allow him to move on, will not allow him to mature into sexuality. The young boy is being trapped in the whiteness of the swans, keeps them in this prepubescent place. So there is a recurring theme of this interference with a maturational mm. process. And even the king um, seeking to bring the the maiden into a maturational process, into this adult feminine dynamism. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the second king, um, our young woman's husband, um, in this uh, version, uh, she has, at the second baby, he, he defends her. Mm -hmm. And then she has a second child, and the same thing happens. The, Mother-in-law uh, sets it up so mm -hmm. that it looks like she's cannibalized the second baby. And this time, uh, the king has to give up uh, and allow her to be burned at the, at the stake. Um, but again, there is an effort on the part of the masculine, the king, uh, the ruling principal, as you said, uh, to protect his wife. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't work. And the saving grace is going to come from the feminine, from the young queen uh, who is standing there. Uh, I, I can't tell you as a child how thrilling I found this, uh, that she stood on the pile of wood. The fire is about to be lit. This is worthy of Hollywood. And she sees the six swans flying through the air. They descend right near her, and um, she throws the sh six shirts over them, and there are her six brothers uh, turned into humans except for one wing on one brother. So th the redemption has to come from the feminine. It cannot come from these kings. Mm -hmm. uh, and what is it that that our young woman has done. She's been silent for all these, some period of years, mm -hmm. uh, and has sacrificed her own, even her own children who were stolen from her. And in other versions of the tale, by the way, um, the babies are restored to her. They were, set a, they were sequestered somewhere, uh, so they didn't die, actually. But uh, she doesn't, I wouldn't, you know, most mothers would protest. Um, where's my baby? I didn't do this. Uh, you know, something horrible has happened here. But she has sacrificed a, a lot of that uh, and, and maintained her silence. And that, that, it, that there is the redemption of she... She stuck to her project. Uh, she was faithful to her vow of silence. Mm -hmm. uh, faithful to her role a as the Redeemer and um, hiding all the children out in a castle in the forest didn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, her throwing down all of her you know, adornments uh, so that the king's hunters would leave, that didn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, and getting married and having a baby, or in her case, two babies, you know, that, that doesn't work either. Mm -hmm. The only thing that works is her sticking to her, her knitting, as it were, mm -hmm. and, and making uh, the shirts that will redeem her brothers. And I have to say that in those six years that she is silent, she herself has learned to become a witch. Mm. Because she somehow now has acquired the same magic that the witch's daughter has, which is to throw magical shirts onto beings and transform their mm -hmm. shapes. So again, the, 
the thing we fear in the beginning and seek to escape, mm. once it is integrated, also becomes the thing that saves us. And, th and this shows up over and over again um, in philosophy, in psychology, is at first, it's new, it's raw, could be a dangerous instinct, but at some point, when it has enough connection to the ego, it becomes an ally and can become the thing that we absolutely need. The mother-in-law also, to me, she is the death mother. To me, she is, she is just like the witch in as much as she is red in tooth and claw. We might even say that the mother-in-law is death itself. The, the young queen may have had two miscarriages. That death has visited this this new this new young maiden, and that because she doesn't is cannot be fertile. I mean, Henry the Eighth was was at the crux of all of this. You know, if these women were not could not give him a son, he was burning them at the stake. So, the fact that the young queen must be fertile in order to carry her role. And the death mother, the witch of the forest, the spirit of nature, keeps interfering with that. And this well, can't well, be story... mediated by consciousness. Yeah. No, but uh, in um, she, she doesn't have miscarriages. She gives birth uh, mm -hmm. to a prince. She she does. She is fertile, but uh, because of the envy uh, and the negativity, you know, of the stepmother and the, then the mother-in-law uh, that, you know, they're trying to quash life. And I'm curious and interested in the fact that what it requires is tremendous sacrifice on the part of the young woman, that she forfeit everything. <clears throat> including uh, to protest her innocence and demand her two children back in order to pursue her task of redeeming her brothers. That the redemption of the masculine is due to the positive feminine. Uh, and uh, that that is what succeeds in defeating the negative feminine. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the witch in the forest, the witch's daughter, and and then the mother-in-law. Mm -hmm. I think we're saying the same thing. I'm just broadening the the story into more mm -hmm. symbolic, mythic levels. But that whatever the old the mother-in-law represents, that she will not allow life to happen in the psyche that she's whether she steals it away and it literally means a child is still born or if maybe the king it's himself is deprived of being able to be fertile but now there's going to be this you know sacrifice this ancient horrific you know sacrifice of burning people alive which again is this terrible vestigial savagery that human beings have done and still do. It, uh, I mean, it's, a, it's shocking to us. But right there, at that moment of life and death, which is where we start the fairy tale, the king is thrust into a moment of life and death. And he chooses life. And then the whole saga continues. And here, once again, life and death is right there. That enormous tension is brought forward, and that constellates the six brothers. We could almost say that being put there in the nadir, in the greatest amount of tension one could imagine, constellates 
certain things in the psyche. So it calls forth or conjures the six swans that descend near her. Somehow, we're suspending all kinds of disbelief. Even though she's about to be burned, I guess she's allowed to carry luggage with her in her arms or not tied to anything. And so she just happens to have these garments that she can just toss out, which is, you know, as it is. And all they have to do is touch them. She has now become a witch. And the six brothers stand there, one who is still partially in this mythic world. It's also a story about it's good enough. You know, like one of the sleeves are missing, but you know, when push comes to shove, you got to just go with what you've got. You know, she, she doesn't yeah. have time to finish that last sleeve. It's like, this is, this is as good as it's going to be, buddy. I don't know that I think she has become a witch. I mean, um, it's a fairy tale, so these are the metaphors uh, for transformation and mm-hmm. and change. I think it, it's uh, a story very, very much about the redemptive power of the feminine in its positive aspect, and that um, it takes a willingness to sacrifice our our young woman the sister of the three bro- of the six brothers uh, gives up a lot uh in order to save her six brothers uh she runs away she gets to the hut she marries the second king she keeps silent when her two children are disappeared, Um, and she has done nothing wrong. Uh, She is the innocent victim of uh, the terrible deeds and is willing basically to suffer that her brothers might be redeemed. And um, I'm remembering... uh, you know, in the in the Lord of the Rings, because we were talking to um, a woman who wrote her thesis about this in Jung's Red Book, there's a place where Sam Ganji says to Frodo, or they're on the last lap of their journey up the awful mountain, of, you know, Sam asks Frodo, what's it all about? And Frodo says, sometimes we have to give things up Sometimes we have to suffer so that others may have them. And because they're just in a terrible space at this last lap of the journey, they're suffering so much. And uh, here in this story, it is the young woman who is willing to suffer that her brothers might be restored that her brothers might have the life uh, that they were intended to have as, as, human, as human boys. Uh, and that this steadfastness and dedication and selflessness is ultimately what, what saves the day. And that is a great story about the heroic feminine. Uh, and talk about actions speaking louder than words. She is silent. She does. She lives it. Uh, I, I often think about and have, and talk to people um, who say, words don't work. You know, I've brought this up to my boss several times. I've brought this up to my spouse. I don't know how many times. Oh, what can I say? Um, Well, sometimes words don't work. And you have to act. And in this story, our girl, the first thing she does is to leave. 
She doesn't go with her father. She leaves and finds the hut. Uh, and the second thing she does is to sew the shirts uh, out of out of asters. So um, I think there is something here about language and how empowering being in yourself can be when you are silent, you are inside, you have an internal interior life, you claim your own life, you have, there's a self-sufficiency that is not dependent on interacting with the next door neighbor or the kid down the hall. Uh, there's a wholeness in what she does. Mm -hmm. So for our listeners, one of the things that's been so wonderfully demonstrated between uh, the position Deb is taking with this particular fairy tale and the position I'm taking is that Deb is, in my estimation, holding a more extroverted view of the story and thinking at times, talking about the characters. Well, if this was a young woman, but she's carrying such virtue, her capacity to sacrifice, her capacity to suffer consciously and be disciplined, and, and in the outer world, what circumstances might we find a person in who then has to access this kind of virtue and strength. For me, I have uh, held and argued for a much more exclusively subjective process that, um, given that it starts with the king, I'm imagining it being in a male psyche. And that, for me, this is a story of uh, a male psyche that goes into, I think, a profound state of grief and loss and that these events are happening psychologically. In the end, what occurs is that the mother complex is finally triumphed over, which has been interfering with the psyche's ability to be generative. Mm -hmm. But it required a tremendous heroic process to go on in the psyche that um, these young sequestered parts of the king, so to speak, had to regress into animal nature and become robbers, had to suffer in these various mm -hmm. ways. And that in one way of thinking, the mother complex and the mother archetype is associated with regression and depression. That the great heroic effort is for the ego of all of us to fight itself out of this instinctive collapse into passivity and regression. And so the final version of the king is one who is able to sacrifice the mother complex, who is able to tolerate the truth. This is what's going on. The anima has a voice. And to choose, finally choose the young queen. Because the king in the beginning of the story cannot just won't choose the young queen. She's creepy. She makes me shudder. <laughs> this king chooses the young queen and that there is a restoration, as you say, Deb, that all of this life force that had gone through this cycle of regression into the instinctive has now come back. I would venture to say that the anima, in fact, has become a witch. There's many stories and we see this with Vasilisa uh, in the Miyazaki uh, cartoon, which is so wonderful, spirited away. You know, the innocent feminine is, is under the tutelage of the ferocious, instinctive goddess and takes on part of those qualities which serves her to great end. So the girl becomes magical. She knows how to do magic, a magic of restoration. And finally, something is resolved. The king principle, the young queen or the wife, all these generative dynamic forces in the, in the six brothers who now can actually mature and not be caught in this prepubescent state 
can live in great joy. So I think there is a progression from the first scene to the last. For me, it is a, I like to look at it as a purely internal process and to think of these various challenges as psychological processes and struggles between archetypes and complexes. And, and it's also giving us a map. You know, these are ways to imagine getting yourself out of being lost into a life that you would want to leave. And there's a, another view of fairy tales that Dev is so wonderfully brought forward where there's practical advice that's being given in fairy tales that applies to lived experiences sometimes. Well, uh, uh, we learn from fairy tales. You know, they mm -hmm. give us uh, life principles of what do you do in this situation? What works? What doesn't work? What do you learn from it? Mm -hmm. But um, uh, it is an internal story. I'm not uh, positing that this is an external event. Um, it, fairy tales like dreams are, you know, one psyche. But what I am positing is that one way or another, uh, access to the positive feminine, access to eros, access to a place that is patient, steadfast, and uh, willing to sacrifice in a loving spirit is the redemptive principle that is lifted up so beautifully in this story. And there is a happy ending, as there often is in fairy tales. Which always is, a happy ending. Which is... Almost always a happy ending. Yes. Um, Encour encouragement to learn, encouragement to live, encouragement mm -hmm. to go through the difficult situation. Yes. Uh, you can prevail. Absolutely. And this fairy tales have been around for hundreds. Many people would say that perhaps even many hundreds, maybe even a thousand years old, some of these, because these stories were probably passed as an oral tradition. Oh, yes. And then at some point were written down. But the Many scholars think these are really, really old tales, and they survive because there's something in them. There's a wisdom that's encoded in these interesting, strange, symbolic stories, and that that wisdom is communicated from mouth to ear, whether they, or not it's explained explicitly. They are stories of how the unconscious develops how psyche does develop, how we can grow and mature of regressions, transgressions, all, all kinds of things that happen below consciousness in all of us. And that's why fairy tales have stayed with us for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. They were not children's stories. They were stories that adults told around the campfire. And just as we all felt, Deb read fairy tales as a kid, so did I. I read the entire Lang series of fairy tales when I was in, in grade school. That when we read them innocently, we put ourselves in the tales. Yes. We are the hero or the heroine, or, or maybe long to be a swan and fly off for all that. And it is through identific identifying initially as children that we also receive an impact. Suspending Absolutely. that disbelief. We're in the ritual drama. I'm there, and there's a witch, and there's <laughs> magic aster shirts. And, and, and sometimes parents are shy about reading children fairy tales because they're often kind of raw. Life and death circumstances occur. But many, uh, many advocates of reading fairy tales say, your children already live in that world. They're not shocked yeah. by this. How many kids walk up to dad and say, Dad, I'm going to shoot you and you'll die, okay? Bang! And the dad goes, <laughs> and he collapses on the ground. And then the kid's running over and he's thrilled. That in the mythic world, you shoot things and they die and they come back to life and there are monsters. And kids manufacture 
and enact these these kind of gruesome <laughs> dramas all the time. So I I hardly think that there's very much in a fairy tale that your kid is going to be surprised about when you watch how they naturally play. But what the fairy tale offers is a way through some of these really complicated conundrums that a child hasn't, thank goodness, hasn't had to come up against, but will likely, whether that's a purely internal experience or some mix of inner or out. So I really hope that all of you, if, if you have children, get a copies of Grimm's fairy tale and don't be shy about reading your kids' fairy tales. And again, don't have to explain them. And for ourselves to be really thoughtful, what is this saying? What, what can I make of this to ask oneself, if this was a dream, what would I do with this? We can then get a glimpse at that eternal aspect of the unconscious that shows up in all of these ancient stories, in fact, has probably written them. So maybe it's time now to transition into a dream. Okay. Our dreamer is a 29-year-old male who is an architect. And he tells us this dream. I'm on a beach. I think my mother is not too far. A woman in a red bikini is standing in the sea, in the shallow waters. She is blonde, tan, with hypersexualized features such as breast implants. I try to interact with her in a sexual way. I'm at her knees. I'm consumed by lust and desire. She tells me that she has to go, but that she will be back. As she leaves, the day turns into night, and she comes back walking on the beach this time. She is now a brunette, slightly skinnier in sweatpants. She also looks more natural. She invites me to follow her. We are now in the living room of the house I grew up in. I still feel that strong sexual desire for her. She sits in our ottoman chair and offers me a bowl of cereal. As I take the bowl to go eat it in the kitchen, every spoonful I grab contains long hair. Somehow, I know that it's hers and I'm slightly disgusted and simply not able to eat. Hmm. For context, he writes, Six months ago, I moved to the United States for a job. I met a woman shortly after, and we are now engaged. Last week, we moved in together in a small house. Next week, she will meet my siblings and mother for the first time. He hmm. says, The main feelings in the dream were lust, desire, and disgust. And he offers a bit of explanation for some of the dream elements. He says, my fiancé's dad died of multiple sclerosis last year, and she hasn't done the blood test to know if she carries the genetic markers for that as well. Hmm. Well, I, I have a, a quick take uh, on the dream, which is how important it is and how fraught it is when you introduce your fiance or a boyfriend or any significant other to your family for the first time. Mm. So since his, his mother and siblings are going to meet the fiance for the first time, I, you know, my, I'm assuming, okay, they're going back home mm -hmm. uh, where all of the family members are. And there's a lot of anxiety around this. He's made a commitment. They've moved in together. Um, you know, gosh, I hope you like her. Uh, and uh, the dream itself says, I'm on a beach. I think my mother is not too far. <laughs> that, sets, that sets a very specific <laughs> stage going into uh, the erotic next section. Freud would have a field yeah. day. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I 
I I'm do a personal riff here. Uh, the first time that I went to meet my now husband's family was on a spring ba- break. We'd been dating in college. Uh, uh, we were driving down to Florida with a bunch of other people, and I'm about to meet um, my boyfriend's at that point uh, family for the first time. His brother, his sister, his father, his mother. And we get to about uh, maybe South Carolina, heading into Florida, which is where his family lived. And all of a sudden, I had one of these uh, moments of like, what am I doing? I am wandering into, uh, you know, who knows what. What if they don't like me? (laughs) It's, It's very fraught. So I'm projecting that. But it it doesn't seem too too far uh, to reach that it, it's a big deal. Um, here's the person I've chosen in life. We've moved in together. Um, how's this going to go? So the the anxiety, perhaps the trepidation. <clears throat> I, I think the dream is, on one level, commenting on that because. There is an evolution in his relationship to the feminine. He's on the beach. The mother is in the proximity. The beach is often interpreted as this kind of liminal thin place where Mm -hmm. we could walk into the ocean, which represents that the deep unconscious. We're on the sand, so we're in a little bit of safe ego space. But we're right on that line. Could have one Mm -hmm. foot in either world easily. Right. And the mother is close. So the mother is close in consciousness, and the the relationship that he has with his mother, I would imagine, is in some ways influencing the the rest of the dream, mm-hmm. or at least we might find evidence yeah. of that. So there's an evolution in his attitude. The woman, the first woman, uh, is offers such an exaggerated sexual dynamism, though the feminine yes. is overwhelmingly erotic. Uh, I mean, an yes. Aphrodite coming out of the sea on the, on the clamshell, you know, as, yeah. as she's sometimes depicted. And it's so overwhelming that he is just on his knees before the yes. archetypal power of the feminine. Yeah. I, I love that the next iteration She's relatable. She she looks kind of natural. Mm -hmm. She's not so exaggerated. He can, he's on his own feet. At least he's not knocked to his knees. And then the third encounter, he's really ambivalent. Ah, wow, hair in my cereal. Yuck. Uh. So there's there's, um, a much more complicated, fulsome experience with the feminine that's attained. I am also um, really aware that as the dream progresses, uh, he says we're now in the living room of the, of the house I grew up in. Mm-hmm. So as, um, a, as he, in waking life, prepares to uh, go back to his place of origin, uh, the child and childhood complexes kick up. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mother is at first not too far, and then we're in the living room where everybody goes to interact uh, of the house he grew up in. And uh, it's curious that for the first woman who is sort of, you know, uh, emblematic of everything, like Marilyn Monroe, of, you know, the hot babe in the red bikini, um, that there's all this sexual desire, uh, and it's still there the second time around where the woman is the brunette, she's skinnier, she's in sweatpants, she looks more natural. But there, mm. there's still a lot of sexual energy sure. here. And I think that, too, creates a tension. And I would, I would put big money down on um, many a young couple going back to the family of origin uh, with a fiancé and trying to balance 
the sexual desire in the home you grew up in when your parents are somewhere in the house or nearby, uh, it, it really sets up a, a lot of activity in the psyche. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and every teenager has experienced it. Of, you know, you're making out on the couch and then you, you hear footsteps and it's like, well, I'm pulling back. Um, we were just talking. Uh, <laughs> Now, come on, I know you did this too. Um, so, uh, but I'm still a little puzzled about the hair in the bowl of, of cereal. Mm -hmm. uh, what other part of the psyche comes up to say, you know, don't do that here. Don't have, um, don't have sexual inclinations uh, in the house. Well, uh, I'm... Yeah, it okay. turns off. So I think that um, we're in that realm, as is true for all, that the anima and the animus have to separate out from the parental complexes. You know, mm -hmm. for, for him, the mother is the first image of the feminine, and the breasts yeah. are important. Yes. I mean, so the breasts in his adult mind, seem exaggerated. But when you're a baby, the breast is bigger than your head. I mean, the breasts are as wide <laughs> as your shoulders. You know, it's, it is of mythic proportion. And we have yes. memories of that relationship. I mean, we have, we have visual images and sensory um, memories that are foundational of the magnitude of the breast and its ability to sate, you know, our howling hungers and comfort us and mm -hmm. all the good stuff that mm. happens in that moment. So yeah. his mother is nearby and the first emergence of the anima one is very archetypal. The breasts are said substantive and she's at, he is at her knees, which is when you think about a little child coming up to her knees. You know, you have innumerable memories of standing there being mm -hmm. only about as high as your mom's knees. So he's really in that place where um, the anima is trying to separate out from the mother complex. And one of the ways that we can imagine that is he's able to feel that enormous sexual dynamism absent the incest taboo. So he's able to experience that without feeling ashamed, mm -hmm. which is great because that needs to happen. If the mother um, archetype is too involved with the anima, then the young man is going to feel very ambivalent. It's going to feel um, strangely and disturbingly transgressive to feel um, so sexually interested. Yeah. No, I think you're making a really good point about there. there's no ambivalence about the anima figure uh, being his fiance in the dream, these two dream women. Uh, so the mother complex is not interfering with his ability to access uh, his sexual desire through these uh, sexualized images of women. But something comes up. That's right. That it says, does. Uh, "Not here." And uh, there's going to be hair in the cereal, and it's going to be gross, and it's yucky. Um, so, so there, there is a, a place of real internal conflict. Exactly. And what I would like to say is, uh, which is a wonderful <laughs> mythologic amplification, is, um. The goddess of the grains is called Ceres, which is where we get the word cereal from. Ah, that's so, right. So there's the mother ah. who's kind of around but not visible. We have the first emergence of the sexualized object. Then she becomes a little more humanized, which she's still lovely, uh -huh. but she isn't so hypersexual. And then we find out that she really is still has too much of the mother in it. So then she gives 
him、uh-huh. the bowl of cereal, and Ceres、uh-huh. is the goddess of agriculture, grain, fertility, and motherly relationships. And so, when the mother kind of、um, breaks back into the、um, erotic dimension, he can't stomach that. It's incestuous.、Right. It's disgusting. Yeah. I, I think you just landed on an archetypal amplification、uh, through uh, connecting serial to series, which is really great stuff. And and series or Demeter is absolutely a a real motherly image. She cre she makes、uh, the crops grow.、Uh, she rescued her daughter Persephone、uh, from Hades. So、uh, here is the mother archetype.、Um, so I'm、uh, changing what I said before. The mother archetype is present in this very subtle but substantial、uh, symbolism of the bowl of cereal because he could have been offered anything to eat. He could have been offered a sandwich,、um, a, a, an apple, a piece of fruit, anything, but he's offered cereal. And there's too so, much of the mother、uh, bringing... in there, so it's yucky. <laughs> yeah, right. And having a fiance in the home where your mom is present、uh, is a big deal.、Uh, and how do we relate to the feminine and the internal feminine of、uh, his own anima? You know, given these、uh, countervailing、uh, currents of what it's like to relate to mom、mm-hmm. and maybe a sister. Mm-hmm. And what it is like to have access to、uh, sexuality with a partner,、um, and I also wonder about if whether there is some ambivalence、uh, in that is、um, implicit, perhaps in his、uh, statement that、uh, that his fiance's father died of, of multiple sclerosis, and、uh, she hasn't done the blood test to know she carries. Genetic、uh, markers, so I didn't know that there was a blood test, but、um, evidently there is, a- and that this is a piece of unfinished business at the very least for him. That sets up an ambivalence of of a fiance if we're going to have、uh, a lifetime partnership.、Uh, this this matters to know this. Exactly. So that can be part of what's hard to stomach at the、mm-hmm. end of the、um, yeah. of the dream. That、yeah. you know, can I really take in that there could be something dangerous that is、um, is present? I also、yeah. want to say that the dream is also giving him an opportunity to understand why he may sometimes hypersexualize women. As a way of trying to separate the mother archetype out from the anima,、mm-hmm. because the first、um, image of the goddess, and I think about these、uh, wonderful、um, Indian statues of goddesses, and their breasts are these like perfect circular half melons. I mean, <laughs>、yes. it's, it, it's <laughs> just so everything is so symmetrical, so perfect, and that. That is a way of him trying to make sure that the motherly stuff is somewhere else; that she's purely an erotic object, and and、yeah. that's reasonable. I mean, the psyche is trying to、yeah. figure out how to separate mother and anima, mother and lover.、Mm-hmm. It comes back in because that process of separating out the mother and the anima is going to happen iteratively. That this will happen over and over and over again, and I think、uh-huh. there is a recommendation in the dream: one, to look at the fiance and say, "Are there some dynamics here where I am unconsciously pressing her to to mother me, and is that really what I want? Does that make sense to me? Is that what she wants? Am I sometimes being hypersexual in the relationship as a way of trying?" To、um, vanquish the motherly ambivalence, but also perhaps 
exaggerating my perception of my fiancé because it's so disturbing. See her in a motherly fashion. So he's, he's working something out in the dream, and the dream is helping him work something out. Yes. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.